Welcome, everybody, and welcome especially to Amy. Amy Corrigan has been a longtime Burke maniac. She's also the co director of the Nollywood Workshop. Um, you can find a link to that on the bio on the webpage. She's also an independent filmmaker and photographer, and she is here to talk to us about Stop Ebola um, and what Nigeria got right. So, welcome, Amy. Thanks. It's so nice to be here, and always great to come to Berkman for lunch. And what a great crowd we have here today. I would really love this to be an informal presentation. I'm excited to share um, what I've got here, but also it sounds like there's a lot of expertise in the room in terms of uh, public health, social media, and Ebola. So please let this be a conversation more than a presentation. Um, I am here to talk about Ebola in Nigeria really with three hats on. The first is as a director, as Amr mentioned, of Nollywood Workshops, which is a nonprofit organization based in Lagos that uses entertainment uh, as a vehicle for all kinds of health and social goals. Um, we were founded to leverage Nollywood, Nigeria's booming film industry, as a platform. Uh, and I've been working in and around Nollywood and Lagos since 2006. I'm also looking at Ebola as an independent filmmaker. Um, I'm in the midst of doing a long-form feature documentary about Nigeria's containment of Ebola. And the third is, here at Berkman, I like thinking about uh, the role of social media and entertainment when it comes to public health. So this conversation will be an attempt to weave all three of those hats together, as well as the fourth hat, which everybody has had on here, is the snow hat. And it's just nice to be in a room full of people again, rather than digging out my driveway. Uh, so let me start with just a general introduction. If I can just uh, get this to view like we want it to. Enter full screen. OK. So on July 20th, hi. 2014, a man named Patrick Sawyer landed in Lagos, Nigeria. Patrick Sawyer was a Liberian-American who had had contact um, with Ebola in Liberia and reportedly came to Nigeria to seek um, better health care. He is known as Nigeria's index case. Now, Lagos, Nigeria has a population of 21 million. That's Guinea, Sierra Leone, Liberia combined. So immediately, there was concern that this could be a public health disaster. Um, Jeff Hawkins is U.S. Consul General to Nigeria, and he said, when you hear the words Lagos and Ebola in the same sentence, what we're talking about is an apocalyptic urban outbreak. Now, that didn't happen, and I'm here to talk about why. Nigeria ended up with 20 Ebola cases and eight deaths contained in 42 days. If you compare this with the 12,000 cases of Ebola and 9,000 plus deaths that we've seen over the past 14 months in the other affected countries, um, you see why the World Health Organization was quick to call this a spectacular success story. So I'm interested in what Nigeria got right, both, like I said, for the purposes of our long feature film, but also for today's talk, I'm going to focus specifically on communications and technology. But I do want to touch on these other components that I think are really essential to the story. So I won't go too in depth, but just to give you a brief overview. The people we see here are the uh, doctors and staff at a hospital called First Consultant. They were the first doctors at the first hospital where Patrick Sawyer was brought after he was exhibiting signs. At first, they didn't know that he had Ebola. But as soon as they did, they made a choice to contain him at First Consultant. This choice um, was described to me by the doctor pictured here as having a grenade in front of you. You have three choices. You can throw it over the fence, you can take a step back, or you can jump on it. First consultant, by containing Patrick Sawyer, jumped on the grenade, and the, many of the uh, nurses and doctors that this team made that decision with passed away. Uh, but it's largely heralded as that choice as being the first significant step for Nigeria to 
contain this outbreak. Another really important component uh, was the leadership of the government. Nigeria at this time, in, over the summer, was in the news for many other reasons besides Ebola. Uh, Boko Haram was a major issue. The Bring Back Our Girls campaign was a major issue. And many Nigerians and people in the world global community had lost their faith in Nigeria's government when it came to handling complex problems. That said, uh, both the president, good luck Jonathan, and more specifically the governor of Lagos State, Governor Fashola, stepped up and made the type of decisive decisions in terms of doling out resources, uh, repositioning uh, staff so that they could give this uh, outbreak the emergency status that it needed. And they did that in the early days of the outbreak, which was again a critical component. Another big piece of this was logistics. Nigeria quickly turned their polio operations center to become their Ebola emergency operations center, bringing many international staff from CDC, Doctors Without Borders, WHO from Abuja to Lagos, where they were able to redirect a lot of their human capital as well as technology to containing the outbreak. So logistics were a key piece of this. Um, and also capacity. Nigeria has the benefit of, compared to some of the other countries that we're talking here, really um, strong and getting stronger health system. So there were, uh, pictured here, you have staff from the African Genomic Center and also University of Lagos, where they were able to do testing of uh, samples right away and confirm uh, whether people had, in fact, been infected. This was critical, and they were able to take those staff and volunteers and deploy them very quickly to critical places like the airport uh, and borders. Here you see somebody trying to enter Nigeria and getting their temperature taken right away. These steps were taken quickly and efficiently. Um, and before we go on, I think it's important to say um, not taking away from Nigeria's strengths. There was also an element of luck here. Patrick Sawyer was a diplomat. He landed in Lagos. He didn't come through a rural border. He landed in Lagos, which is um, in many ways a, one of Africa's commercial centers, a cosmopolitan city. Uh, and he was a diplomat. So he was taken very quickly to First Consultant Hospital, which is one of the best hospitals in Nigeria. So there was an element of luck here that not only was Patrick Sawyer elite, he was given the set of services that are so often reserved for the elite in a place like Lagos, where there is quite a strong distance between the health care that the wealthy receive and the healthy that the poor receive. So part of this reason that the uh, outbreak never reached these densely populated slums was because it never really went into that social strata, luckily. Uh, now I want to turn to communication and technology, which I think, personally, because I'm a Burke maniac, is probably the most exciting part of Nigeria's story. Um, and I think about it in a couple ways. One, uh, how can other countries learn from what Nigeria did? And also, how can we learn from Nigeria's use of communication and technology uh, and turn that towards other major health issues, both in West Africa and around the world? So just a little snapshot on Nigeria. Nigeria has a great fortune of being uh, one of the highest um, mobile and internet penetrated countries in Africa. Um, I think it's the total population of Nigeria is 170 million. And of that, there's 114 million active mobile subscribers. So that's. 40, that's quite high, and 40% of Nigeria is connected to the internet. Um, that makes them the 100th plugged in country in the world, but there's quite a difference between uh, Liberia, Sierra Leone, uh, Guinea, where I believe there might be more experts in the room on this, where the internet penetration is about 10% rather than 40. So this was an incredible um, advantage. And, I spend a lot of time, given my entertainment background, spend a lot of time thinking about the power of the internet in Nigeria as a platform for communications and also as a commercial platform. But here we see the benefit 
really, of the Internet as a utility that was already there and available for people to use in getting essential information across. Uh, this is a piece that I'm not looking at too much in my current research, but I just want to mention contact tracing in Nigeria is a key element of containing the Ebola outbreak. Every person who had been in contact with the index case, Patrick Sawyer, or someone who had been in contact with Patrick Sawyer had to be traced. This ended up resulting in 18,000 meetings and monitoring of people who were in that sphere. Now, because of Nigeria's work on polio, there was some development of mobile technology that could be used on both on cell phones and in vehicles for people to map the contact tracing. That means not just mapping the people who they're tracing, it's mapping the tracers themselves to make sure that they're remaining accountable to the mission at hand. Um, it also meant that those who were in the field tracing with their mobile devices were able to uh, quickly get that information back to headquarters, uh, which I'm not sure the exact percent. I think it was a 9% faster turnaround of information on this, these critical points. And that could be anything from is somebody who has Ebola uh, remaining in their location or what is the temperature of a person who has had contact with somebody infected? This is a lot of information. It's critical in the early days that it's kept um, contained, and Nigeria did an excellent job with this, and I'm quite certain that we'll see this technology extended from Nigeria to other countries and other outbreaks. Now, because my focus is uh, entertainment and communication and social media. Now I'm going to spend a little time on three case studies that I think are really powerful and exciting um, when it comes to Nigeria's success. And the first is Ebola Alert. Ebola Alert is a, a nonprofit organization that was founded in the early days of the outbreak by volunteer doctors. Um, most importantly, Dr. Lawal Bakari, who is a dentist and public health aficionado who realized that there was something important to do. They quickly started this Ebola Alert Twitter account uh, as a platform to both share information and respond to questions that were coming up in Nigeria's social media. Uh, they started this entity and then the government brought them in to the Ebola Operations Center. So it was a really unique moment where uh, the public saw a need created a response and the government was able to fold it in into their into their intervention. So rather than hearing me talking nonstop, I thought it might be interesting for you to hear from some of the team at Ebola Alert about what inspired them to start this and how it worked. So I'm going to switch to a first video clip. Uh, these are a series of interviews that I did on a recent trip to um, Lagos. And let's see if we can play this. It was a case study for Ebola outbreak in urban community, urban densely populated community. So it was extremely scary for everybody, from those who were handling healthcare in Lagos to the man on the streets. And I can remember then on, on social media, it was it was like a Magadon. Sincerely, you could palpate fear if you know how to filter social media information. You realize what people were saying and how they are saying it. You realize that this is just pure fear. So, part of what we realized we had to do then was to inform people because ourselves we were scared. We, we were not sure where it was going to. Back then, the statistics was 90% of cases die. Back then, the statistics was there was no cure to Ebola. So okay, let me show you my yeah. office. So this is Hello. So when people ask Ebola, like, how do you people do this thing in this short while? So at the moment we are working on like close to eight projects, and we we are moving the eight projects almost at the same speed. But it's because the level of expertise, and then the 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 we we apply what we call design thinking. So we are we are a big fan of design thinking here 
and we hope that we can actually contribute to the, to the movement of design thinking, as it were. The lean methods of getting things done, the creative core of things, and the need to, 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 de to deploy a prototype instead of waiting to, for the full thing to be done, and the need to go out with a protocol, with a prototype as fast as you can so that you test and get people to give you feedback so that you can get to the final product and you're out there in the shortest time possible, taking away all of the bureaucracies. The question was, is there anything being done by the government to you know, give people information on social media? And the answer to that question was no. And that was how it all, it all started. So we, we, created a, we created a Twitter account just to inform people about Ebola. That simple solution we started back then has uh, been able to, uh, as we, we now have over 70,000 followers on Twitter and in the past few months of operation we've had over 90 million impressions on Twitter alone. So, but the problem we identified then was that most of the information that was available was too technical or people could not relate to them, or some people were not aware that this uh, information was available. Right now, uh, the population of Africa is 1.111 billion, according to 2013 estimate, but only 20% of that number, only uh, less than 20% of that number are actually connected to the internet. So you cannot exactly say that Africa is on the internet, because over 900 million Africans out of 1.1 billion people are not on the internet. So we realized that we needed to develop a system whereby the same way we're engaging people online through social media and all of that, we wanted a system that would help us reach out to people that were not online. Where we developed a system where we were able to recruit a lot of volunteers in different places. We mapped where they, are, where they were and those people were going to go out and they will talk to people that the internet will most likely not be able to reach and they were sharing information on Ebola and they were reporting in real time. If you are looking for, if you are looking for any solution, any communication system that is pervasive enough that can reach as many Africans as possible, you want to pick mobile telephony because in Africa, out of the population of 1.111 billion, you have over 750 million uh, mobile subscribers. Things that are done with a creative mindset, with a need to be innovative, will, will impact lives in, long, in a very beautiful way. So for instance, Ebola Alert indeed is a, is a design experiment. And it has proven that design can do a lot. So that's a short introduction to the work of Ebola Alert. And what I find so inspiring about their intervention um, is thinking that they were able to design, brand, launch a multi-platform social campaign on Twitter, Facebook, website, live chat, and a 24-hour hotline um, in about a week. On, on a volunteer budget, and then, then the government signed on. Now, imagine that same initiative in New York City or Texas. Just in your mind, think about the time it would take and what it would cost to reach as many people as Ebola Alert was able to reach in such a short time. To me, um, they deserve an incredible amount of credit, not just in engaging the public on some very basic uh, Ebola education in terms of what is Ebola, how do you recognize signs and symptoms, and what do you do if you or someone you know has signs and symptoms of Ebola. They also were able to take some of the fear out of this. They were available as a 24-7 resource for anybody with a question or concern. We know, what we know about infectious disease like e Ebola is, is fear leads to stigma, which can lead to hiding, isolating, not reporting, all the, all the key things that uh, can result in um, a much worse outbreak than Nigeria saw. So also, 
I think some of the key takeaways for me from Ebola Alert was they're savvy on taking the online and quickly using it to engage the offline and then using the tools at hand and bringing that information back online. Um, Next, I want to share a little bit about Lens on Ebola. Lens on Ebola was a multimedia campaign that my organization and three others uh, produced uh, in the first week um, as a response to some misinformation and lack of information. Um, we engaged 18 of Nigeria's top movie stars um, and a star director, Tunde Kalani, and were able to produce um, three PSAs in five different languages um, for a budget of $40,000 in seven days. Um, this is Tunde Kalani, a Nigerian star director. Um, this is just a shot behind the scenes. You see a, a tele simple teleprompter that was used to translate information that we were able to um, develop into scripts in partnership with the CDC, making sure we had their key information translating it into the five different languages, Hausa, Yoruba, Igbo, Pidgin, and English. And then finding stars that spoke those languages, um, casting the PSAs and um, distributing them very quickly on multiple channels. Um, we were able to get these PSAs out on ten major TV stations, um, four radio stations as radio versions. They were screening 24-7 on 100 public buses throughout the city. We included them in community screenings um, and also, of course, on online channels. We were had the great fortune of having a partnership with Facebook, who in the early stages of the days in Nigeria recognized uh, how major Facebook is for Nigeria. I mean, there was a recent um, survey that went out sh showing, I think, that 10% of Nigerians believe that Facebook is the internet. Oh, no. We'll get to that later. And But in this case, uh, Facebook proved to be an incredibly effective tool which allowed us to get, you know, um, a, a million impressions on these videos within the first couple days. Um, and also these, uh, you'll, uh, you see up here um, a few clips from the Facebook page where we posted the PSAs. I think just as valuable as the media itself was the engagement that we had with the fans of the media where we were able to um, get their comments, get their questions and respond to them and those informed future interventions. Uh, we were able to build on the campaign with a star Desmond Elliott is one of Nigeria's top actors and just to give you a sense of his reach he has 1.8 million fans on his own Facebook page. So the CDC quickly recognized that his platform was an even more valuable platform than the CDC's page as far as Nigeria was concerned. So we were able to team up with a rep from the CDC and do a live Q&A on Desmond's page where for two hours fans of Desmond could come and ask any question or concern that they had about Ebola. Now, we thought that fans would come and ask a question here or there about Ebola, and then more so ask about Desmond and his upcoming film or his romantic life. Um, we were shocked to find that we only, in two hours, we got, I think, three questions a minute. Only one of those questions was not Ebola related. And the CDC said that by far it was the most meaningful um, social media exchange they'd been able to have um, in Nigeria at this time. And my takeaway for this one has very little to do with even my organization and what we did, and all to do with the power of celebrity uh, in the time of an outbreak. Um, Desmond, in an environment that is often wrought with um, corruption and mistrust of public figures. Desmond is somebody that the audience has a relationship with. So when he comes onto a platform that they recognize in a voice that they trust, people, people listen. Um, we were able to take Desmond's work on just basic Ebola information like signs and symptoms and turn it into a, an anti-stigma campaign. This was at the tail end of Nigeria's outbreak and our top priority was making sure that those who had been infected with Ebola and survived were welcomed back into their communities. Um, and he was a key figure in that for Nigeria. Um, 
I want to show you a video interview with a Nigerian star named Ricardo Akbor. He is a Yoruba star and also speaks, speaks English and Pidgin and starred in our um, Pidgin hand washing video. So I'll show you a great interview with him and then a clip of the video just to put a little bit into context from a celebrity perspective um, what it was like to participate in this campaign. I'm Ricardo Agbo. I'm an actor and I was part of the people that partook in lanes on Ebola. We were all tr thrown into that kind of panic. Everybody was now trying to watch. People started wearing gloves. I mean, the, <laughs> the fear was palpable, seriously. Mm, uh, the line while we were shooting Ebola was, um, stay calm, stop Ebola. And the part I took, I spoke in Pidgin English, and that is, Mona, just not fear. We now come on hand for Ebola. What's in the half for now? Since Mona has just the good, they come, the good, they come. Now, this hand's not in the wash. You get what's in the half <laughs> My dear. So they wash hand all the time with warm water, mm. ashes and soap. Now to they prevent disease like Ebola. E Ebola what? Ebola. Or you can't wash your hands. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Just to wash hands. Wash hands. You know say Ebola is a serious disease. No, you don't need to tell And me. we need to prevent and where where. In fact, I am here. You you know say uh, no we say only say you find them. You too correct. I <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't get any business. Eh? At all, Mami at you, all. Mami and you for life. <laughs> People need something that would really help their retention. And thereby, uh, actors were called uh, because, yes, some of us have that kind of uh, uh, followership. And um, when they see people they can recognize, they want to see what message the people are trying to pass. The uh, drama made it something easier for people to want to sit and watch because normally you want to pass a message you don't just sit there and start talking for some other people it becomes boring so the entertainment makes it um it it, it makes it stick for them because the message gets passed through some art artistic ability which makes it indelible in their minds at all time and for us to come out and say this is what is happening this is what you need to do not to endanger yourself. It, it, it went a long way. It went a long way. <laughs> Hello, my people. My name is Nabayo Bankole. I did here to tell you the main demand about Ebola. My brother and my sister, my father and my mother, all you small, small picking, remember to wash your hand well, well, many times with water or ash, especially if you don't touch person we sick. Carry them go health center with government don't choose to wash our hands not the best defense where we get against Ebola and other disease then. Keep calm and stop Ebola. Rest here. Stay healthy with information way correct and together with our healthcare workers, we fit protect ourselves from Ebola. Get correct facts and share with you. The question here was, did he say water or ice? He said water or ash. 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 ash is a way, if you have no access to water, ash is a way to clean your hands. Oh, okay. Um, so along with uh, warm water and soap or hand sanitizer, uh, public health officials were uh, recommending ash uh, as a potential okay. way the, of... The lady in the previous episode also said something about it. ash. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So that gives you a little taste of some of the... Um, communication that was going out on social media, right. leveraging Nigeria's uh, stars. Um, we learned quite a bit from this. We, we tried three styles of PSA. One that was sort of straight to camera, like the last one you saw. One that was dramatic, very serious. And one that had an element of humor. And 
it was our hunch, and then we were glad to find out that the humorous one worked the best. It's what people wanted to share, and it's also um, the one that led to more retention of the key uh, public health messages, and also, most importantly, the hotline. Our number one aim in creating these videos was trying to make uh, awareness of uh, that 1-800 Ebola help u ubiquitous. Um, uh, and hopefully we've played a small role in that. Let's see. I definitely want to leave some time for questions, so I'm going to speed through this last piece. Uh, pictured here, uh, we have Dennis and Justina. Dennis is an Ebola survivor, and this is his wife, fiance, sorry, Justina, who passed away. Um, Justina, uh, you'll hear from Dennis a bit more, but just to share a little, Justina was a nurse at uh, the hospital, first consultant, and she was on her first day of the job when she had contact with Patrick Sawyer before they knew that he had Ebola. So she was infected in the very early days um, before many of Nigeria's um, responses had been implemented. So we're going to hear from Dennis about uh, his fiance's experience and his experience. And I'm including this interview long form because I feel it speaks to, um, far better than anything I can say, really the way social media influenced people's experiences with Ebola in Nigeria and it also shows how we can leverage these tools to really make an impact. So um, just as a heads up, this uh, interview is a little bit emotional and a little bit graphic in places. So um, here we go. My name is Dennis Aka and I'm an Ebola survivor. On the 20th of July, that was when the first Ebola case came into Nigeria. And um, on the 21st of July, my fiancé resumed um, in that same office, in that same um, organization, where the index case was admitted. And that was how she got infected. Before then, she was um, two months gone. She was pregnant, if you know what I mean. She was pregnant, and we were planning to finalize our marriage plans by October, so which means we are expecting a baby. So um, she got infected in the process because she was one of the nurses that cared for um, the Indus case. And um, when, so, you know, when the Indus, uh, Justina, that's her name, Justina Ejelona. She's, um, she's a wonderful person. She inspired me a lot. She, she's, um, She's one person that um, everybody knows her too well. In fact, she, she happens to be, um, she's an addict, or let me say she was an addict to Facebook. And that was how a lot of persons get to know that she was infected. Because um, they could no longer see her on Facebook. And even while in the isolation world, she was Facebooking. She was telling her friends, the whole world, you know, where she is and, you know, people started praying for her, people started, you know, that was when um, um, some of her friends were campaigning for, for the American government to send um, um, uh, what they call it, the, the vaccine, you know, so um, she's someone, if given the opportunity to meet over and over again, I mean, I will. Two weeks after she got in contact with the in this case, she went down. She started stooling. She started vomiting, and um, she had a miscarriage along the, that same day. So I said, okay. So, but on that day, I knew this could be Ebola. I started making calls. I called the Ebola a lot. Called a lot of persons, and that was how I moved her out of the house. In the process of taking care of her in the house, I believe that was when I got infected as well. Um, but um, I never mind. 
all what all that was in my mind was um, I just wanted her to be alive. And there was no volunteers. There was no caregivers at that time because a lot of persons were scared. Why? Because um, because of the information that says 90% um, of those who are infected die, which is nine out of ten. And um, Ebola is a deadly disease. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a death sentence. You see, so all this information going here and there, people were scared to come around to help. Ten days after she was admitted, she died. And then um, two days after she died, I started experiencing my own symptoms. And you see, one thing I did when I was in the isolation center was um, we had the opportunity to go online. So we had the opportunity to, we were given our phones, you know, to do a lot of things. So I was checking, I was going online to, I checked the number of survivors, you know. So I was listening to their stories, how they survived, and what they went through. And I said to myself, if this person can survive, I am going to survive. You see? So they should always look um, up to people who have survived the virus or the disease. I say, if this person can survive, which means I am going to survive, I am not going to die. You see? So even though um, the assistance came a little bit late, but when everybody started coming out, you know, the response was was so high and uh, people started responding, you know, the caregivers, the contact tracers, they were tracing, they were, they were working 24-7, see, and, um, you know, it's, it's, really, it's really encouraging and I'm so proud of um, what Nigeria did, more especially Lagos State, you see, it wasn't easy, but, you know, I'm proud, I'm proud of Nigeria and um, if every other country can emulate what Nigeria did, you know, in trying to contain Ebola, I think um, we will fight this. We will fight this war. We will fight it, and we will definitely win. I share that interview with you not just to illuminate the power of social media and communication when it comes to addressing lack of information or fear, but also how powerful access to internet can be when it comes to hope and the psychology of a disease like Ebola is such that uh, those who are infected need to be able to believe that they may have a chance of surviving. And people who, like Dennis, were brave enough to um, take on the stigma and come out and identify as a survivor and tell their story um, through the platforms available, I believe have um, helped to reduce stigma both in Nigeria and in other um, affected countries. Here, this bottom left picture is a picture that um, Dennis and the World Health Organization and many other organizations followed suit. It's him after he's been um, declared Ebola free getting a haircut at his old barber. Um, so here uh, I think it's a good time to stop and talk about uh, issues presented and also opportunities. I'm really excited to think about how what we've learned from Nigeria, like I said, can be applied to other health issues in Nigeria. Um, and I'm also interested in thinking about how uh, the digital divide comes up in this story, where Nigeria uh, is far better off than so many of its neighbors in terms of internet access and mobile penetration. And I believe that the success we've seen here is in large part due to that. Um, so how do we extend some of our conversations about the internet um, as a utility that everybody deserves equal access to and make sure that we're keeping um, places like Nigeria and Nigeria's neighbors in mind. So that's what I've got now. I'm excited to hear from you guys. And questions, comments, and also please share your expertise. Question: Are you um, differentiating between access to the internet and access to mobile devices? And I said you explain that. Yes, uh, definitely. Um, I'm okay. So when the Facebook question comes up, that becomes important because Facebook, uh, the reason so many um, users consider it the internet is because it's often the only um, application on their mobile phone that's low bandwidth enough and um, cheap enough for them to get online and access. So a person with access to a mobile device may have access to Facebook, 
who may not have access to a computer or be able to afford um, uh, internet time. So that I think it's an important distinction between access to mobile and access to internet. And it's also important to parcel out um, what we make sure people have access to through mobile. So mobile broadband is another big issue on the rise for Nigeria. And just like um, many Nigerians leapfrogged over landlines to mobile phones, I suspect we'll see them leapfrogging over internet access to mobile broadband. Hi. Hi. <coughs> Um, you mentioned that one of the most successful messages was one that contained humor. Yeah. And I was just wondering if you could go into detail or give us an example of what you mean. And is Nigerian humor different from other mm -hmm. humor? And if so, how? Because humor is a very broad term, and I wonder if you could be more specific. Sure. So I'm speaking specifically about... Uh, Nollywood style video, which is our domain at Nollywood Workshops. And the type of humor that we see playing out in those films is often very dialogue heavy humor, um, stemming in large part from Nigeria's theatrical tradition. So we learned um, that the joke in our, in our hand washing video was sort of a, a slapsticky gendered joke where the woman's washing her hands again and again and the husband's like you're washing your hands all day like why do you keep washing your hands seriously you're still washing your hands yeah. um which played out in its own way in each of the languages that we used um but the general uh tension between the husband and the wife was there and then the resolve was she's saying basically you dummy, don't you know that hand washing is the most definite way of protecting yourself from Ebola and other diseases? Um, which is where he's like, ah, you're always right again. Which is sort of a, a standard um, sort of gender play that we see a lot in Nollywood films. So that's one example, and what we were comparing it to was an, another dramatic version, uh, a PSA that we produced um, to raise awareness of signs and symptoms, where it was, again, it was a husband and wife environment, but a much more serious um, woman's expressing signs and symptoms, husband's concerned, there's drama, there's emotion, and they decide to call the hotline, um, which was an extension of some of the more dramatic style Nollywood films that we see. Did that answer your question a little bit? Uh, yes. How has the message gotten out into parts of the country where the government doesn't, where the, the central government doesn't have effective control, where Boko Haram is the central is the authority, or did the the epidemic stayed confined to Lagos, so that wasn't an issue? Luckily, the epidemic stayed confined to both Lagos and Port Harcourt, which is in the southern part of the country. Um, all of the communications interventions I'm aware of, uh, like ours, like Ebola Alert were um, careful to make sure they were communicating in Hausa, that they had Hausa partners in the northern region. Um, but knowing full well that um, social media would not penetrate those audience in the ways that it luckily did in Lagos, I think had we seen uh, an outbreak in the northern part of the country on the communication side, we would have seen much heavier efforts in radio which remains the far the best um, the best medium in those parts of the country, but I think it's it's very lucky that the outbreak didn't travel to that region because, like you said, it, it's not just lack of government control; it's last, lack of access to basic services. Hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to some extent about the framework that you use when you think about creating the adverts that you have. And I, I'm saying that just simply because I feel like there's a muddying of the waters between two sort of separate messages. One is about containment of Ebola. And from that perspective, all you really need to do is ensure compliance of a population to allow for them to allow for contact measures to occur, mm -hmm. right? To allow for contact tracing to occur, 
is the Ebola, is the, is the actual need that you have to do for Ebola to be stopped. You need to allow health workers to be able to go into your community and accept tracing and for them to be open and divulge that information. So that's one thing that you do. Everything else that you do outside of that is being an entrepreneur of a crisis. Mm -hmm. And when you're an entrepreneur of a crisis, there's a lot of stuff you can do with that, right? And, and what your message is changes as a result of it. So for example, the picture of the person, the wife washing her hands at the kitchen, and he says, why are you washing your hands all the time, right? That's a bad message if we're talking about learning for the future. You should have asked, why do you always wash your hands when you leave public transportation? Mm -hmm. Why do you always wash your hands right after you make a meal? Why do you always wash, right? And you tie the message to some deeper learning in yeah. the moment because you have that entrepreneurial component to this, right? You have the opportunity for a learning moment as a result of a crisis, right? So there are two, two separate things that are going on and your messaging sometimes speaks to one, sometimes speaks to the other and sometimes mixes, and I wonder if you separate those and acknowledge them more in, a, in an actual framework, that you might actually have a better way of distinguishing what it is that you're trying to do and what you're accomplishing. Yes, would you like to come work with our organization? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I, everything you just said is so important. We had one mandate, and it was urgent, which was help us manage fear. Um, we were working with the CDC and um, WHO to work with Nigerian celebrities to help um, get the message, keep calm and stop Ebola across. And that message was crafted, one for the keep calm part, don't, no fear, manage hysteria, um, and stop Ebola, as in stop Ebola together. We're in this together. Um, there's a lot that we were intending to do differently on our next round. I mean, the, you hit it right on the head with the hand-washing video. There are also some elements of that hand-washing video, which it, her at the sink with the glasses, probably not the most hygienic set for that message to get across. Um, and we were eager to reiterate with another round of PSAs, but we didn't need to because the, the outbreak was contained in that timeline. I think there is a tension between managing uh, fear and creating a relationship with an audience and getting essential information across that might be pedantic. And if you do the pedantic one too much, it can be at the expense of the other. The reason these videos worked is because they were uh, Nigerian produced with Nigerian stars and didn't have the uh, sort of global international development feel to them. They looked like Nollywood movies and I think we, we did revisions back and forth, back and forth, back and forth with the CDC on the scripts making sure that we were hitting their key notes but making sure that we were maintaining from the perspective of the audience an entertainment feel that would help maintain the trust of the audience and I think there is a tension there and um, while we luckily don't have the chance to iterate on Ebola in Nigeria we're eager to take this um, campaign lens on and apply it to lens on malaria lens on polio and I think we'll be able to test out a lot of the things that you raised Hi. I was wondering um, the application of your like the sharing like Facebook yeah. And how those things apply to the older um, like population of the country? Because, I mean, all my friends, I'm Nigerian, and mm. all my friends share that I saw those videos yeah. on Facebook. But then, cool. in, in order to like sh to show like my parents, it would have to be like pick the laptop up, right, and be like, "Do you want to see this video?" Versus them going. So was that like an effort to like ask people to do that, or because another way of doing that was also share it through text. Right. Was that something that people did, or maybe like putting it in front of Nollywood movies, like because Nollywood movies have yeah. those like things in the beginning. Exactly. Was was there like some effort, like in that? Yes, I'll go backwards. All awesome questions. Um, the first one in terms of putting the PSAs in front of Nollywood movies. Uh, yes, specifically we have an edited version of the hand washing one, which, like you mentioned, applies to so many other health issues and infectious diseases. That is now. Um, going in front of Tunde Kalani's latest Dazzling Mirage at community screenings around Lagos. So I think it, that PSA has been, was seen by 
750,000 people last week in open community screenings, and we hope to place them in front of, um, like you said, DVDs, which Nollywood DVDs have a chance of reaching upwards of 10 million people for a very low cost. Um, in terms of the how do you take the plugged-in audience and make sure that those messages extend to our parents or the generation beyond. I think there is a play for making sure that online affects the offline again. And our other part of our tagline was share what you know. And so maybe that's through sharing this video, maybe that's through SMS, maybe that's through just sharing the facts and um, in conversation. And we, we found that these um, social channels were really helpful in correcting myths to that point. There was a rampant myth um, right at the height of the outbreak that said that salt water could cure Ebola. So we actually had a couple people pass away by drinking salt water and bathing in salt water so much so that it poisoned them and they died. Um, so it became an urgent need to address that myth and um, Twitter was effective in that. But I think it's there's reason to believe that it might start on Twitter, but then it extends to conversations at home. And if there's one person who's gotten the facts in their family, I have a staff member who was recounting to me the story where he had a sister call him and tell him about the salt water cure and encourage him to have his family um, do, do the salt water. And he was working on our campaign with us, so he knew that salt water was a myth that the Ebola community was actively trying to address. He said, what he did was, he said, um, thanks, who told you that? Ah. And he called that person and said, who have you called? And then he got on his mobile device and he called every single person that that, um, wow. that uh, family member had been in contact with. And I think that's just a nice example of how the online engagement can extend to the offline. Um, and then as far as SMS goes, yes, uh, the, like I said, Lego State Government was incredibly active throughout mm -hmm. this outbreak through their Ebola Emergency Operations Center, and they were sending blanket SMS, I think, through all the carriers, um, encouraging people to stay aware of signs and symptoms, to report any incidences to the hotline, which was free. Hi. Um, it sounds like Facebook was a big part of getting this message out, and I was wondering uh, if Facebook provided like free ads or if you had to buy them. Y yes. I wondered how often they were shown to people, like product placement. I wondered how you knew if that was working. You know, like yes. all um, of that part of it. Like, how much did Facebook help you versus how much did you have to fit things up yourselves and then? Hope they'd float to the Facebook helped us a lot. Facebook, what Facebook did is they agreed to post our content on their Facebook safety page and use their magic algorithm and make sure that that showed up in all the feeds of all the affected countries. Um, then they ran, they for free ran ads against it um, and boosted all of our posts. All right. So they gave us the special sauce and. Yes, thank you to Facebook. Um, and I'm torn about how to think about that moving forward. Do we um, try and craft a relationship with Facebook like that um, so that all of our public health interventions have that component? Um, what are the pros and cons of that? Um, they were very generous in their sort of fire hose approach to this content, um, and it preceded their own Facebook's Ebola campaign. I think they deserve some applause for their involvement in this in this outbreak. Um, I'm on the record, so I can't say I'm off the record, but I think we have to balance that with the commercial interest that Facebook has in it in expanding its subscribers in Africa and think that through carefully. I want to jump on, on that in terms of, because I know many, if you want to like reach many, like not just Nigerians, but Africans as well, most people are also moving onto like Instagram and Twitter now. Yeah. They are bigger, it's bigger, it's getting just as big as Facebook. And also WhatsApp mm -hmm. is something that 
is really big now that people don't use blackberries anymore exactly and, like, the move away from blackberries has increased whatsapp so that's something that people use my mom now knows how to use whatsapp so that means everyone knows how to use whatsapp <laughs> to me so um i think that's something you can also explore i think you're right we're looking at twitter has been central all along um mm. the thing i find tricky about Twitter is the skewed metrics of diaspora and international community in terms of their engagement with the tweet. So we've had a challenge with our Twitter metrics, and that might be because we don't have the same relationship with Twitter that we do with Facebook, where they're willing to help us get an accurate demographic of where people are coming from. Um, again, but you no know, tw Twitter, I would put at the top of the list in terms of both getting information out and getting a mapping of what the information environment looks like. And I'm really excited to explore um, WhatsApp as a complement to SMS for future. Any other questions or comments? Um, I really enjoyed listening to, to your presentation and contrasting that in my mind to the work we're doing still in Guinea where we have a radio um, network, a central um, FM radio that's networked to 23 community radios in the rural wow. radio um, uh, network. And, you know, there you have to imagine a completely offline mm -hmm. um, environment and um, still very rife with rumors. So school should have started back and it's not in because there's a whole new set of rumors that have kind of come up and there's a lot of different reasons for that. But one of the things that strikes me the most about the difference between what you, you, you experienced in Nigeria and, and pretty much what we saw in Liberia, Sierra Leone, where we're also working, and Guinea is um, is really the, the sort of public policy and political engagement mm -hmm. side. And um, I think from the from the get go in in Guinea and in well in all three countries, um, the population and our journalists and people were reporting cases and the government was denying for political reasons the existence of Ebola. Um, Sierra Leone was coming off of a cholera epidemic which had really hurt the country. There was a lot of stigmatization around there and so they had a very um, uh, very hesitant to actually declare a public emergency. So you lost this key period. Um, they also tried mm -hmm. to control any kind of information that went out and so and even the international community bought on to that. So, the journalists that understand their, their audience and speak the local languages and speak the idiom and understand the humor and understand mm -hmm. how to craft PSAs that are credible and will have effect, we're told, no, everything has to go to the Ministry of Information right. or the Ministry of Health, which were the two weakest, weakest links in those countries. So, you know, you had a, you missed a really important window because there was the idea that we're going to control information, it's going to come from the top and we're going to create messages that are sometimes created offshore, so, you know, in, in London or in D.C., mm -hmm. and we're going to pump those out. And I think we saw very quickly that that was not going to work. And in Guinea, we saw that tragically when journalists were, um, and a group of health workers were actually killed, attacked by a community. Mm. Um, and so it, I think there's a lot of reasons for that. And I think those are, what, as we look at these, you know, the four countries, really, mm -hmm. and try and get some lessons, I think those are important differences and, and that it, I think I'm just stunned and, and really impressed by how quickly you and your team could put out some really high quality and for a very good price when you look at some of the funding that BBC Media Action and others, right. they're still trying to put out their um, PSAs now that they that are so out of date and mm -hmm. in the wrong languages. So what you've done is really yeah. impressive and I think that, that rapid response locally is something that um, it's really key in any kind of, you know, as soon as the information's out of date, you lose your credibility with your audience. Right. If you're not talking about the rumor that's circulating right now, then you are not, it's coming from outside or somewhere internationally. Completely. And for me, that underscores Lagos's incredible human capacity where you have the entertainment industry in place, trained professionals who can script, shoot, edit export and distribute in multiple languages in a week. You have designers, developers, social media experts who are there working, understanding the environment and, and ready to seize the opportunity. And so my takeaway for this is the really the importance for training in these creative sectors 
um, in, in design and development in some of these places where not only is there a real economic reality of having sustainable careers in those fields, but also real impact that can be made when the content is coming from a local perspective and quickly. And in terms of the government, yeah, I can't really say enough how Governor Fashola's response, immediate response to Ebola and Lagos led to this containment, really, as you know, Ministry of Information, Ministry of Health, everything can be either um, amplified and expedited or shut down by a ministry. And his um, both calling it emergency and then releasing the funding, I think, let everything happen, which to me, um, it'll be really exciting. I think Fushola will have a unique legacy as a African leader who demonstrated good governance. And I'd love to talk to anybody who's thinking how the relationship between good government, good governance and public health at the state and city level. Hi. Why was it that movie stars or stars had such an important role? And it sounds like in essence they were the creation of the media enterprise help solve this as members of the So Nigeria has a long history of um, its entertainment sector, Nollywood, which is um, a driving force in the Nigerian economy. Um, and the audience loves these stars. And th the narrative around it for our work, and I think in the general Nollywood story, is people were tired of seeing American movies, they wanted to see stars that they could relate to. And that is, to me, the driving force of why Nollywood films are so popular in Nigeria and regionally. And then again, why those stars um, have... How long has Nollywood's been going on for about 30 years now. Yeah. Yeah, go for it. Okay. Um, it seems like one thing that was probably helpful here is that I guess Nigerians have a fairly friendly relationship to the U.S., so a message that that's coming from the U.S., like you're having the CDC on that celebrity's uh, Facebook page, is well received. Would this have been harder to do in a country where the population was not friendly to the U.S.? Definitely. Absolutely. And I think it's it's not just the that the audience is friendly to the U.S., it's that um, some of those agencies like CDC um, have a long history of working in Nigeria on other health issues, so they are sensitive to the landscape and um, have a little bit of a better idea how to frame key information in a way that will be received and heard. trying to do this in Sudan or Libya would be really different, say. Right, and I think um, also even in, in Guinea where there, there was general mistrust about Western influence on the origins of the outbreak. We don't have that necessarily. Well, I should say we don't have that in Lagos. Right. right. And again, I think had Ebola shown up in another part of Nigeria, we might be having a very different conversation today. If Ebola showed up in another part of Nigeria, would the Nollywood stuff have been as useful? Yes, so when we think about working in northern Nigeria, we work with Connywood, which is Nigeria's Hausa film industry based out of Kano. So while the our thoughts around content would have been similar, um, developing Hausa scripts with Hausa stars in a Hausa storyline style, our distribution would have been different. We wouldn't have been able to rely on um, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter in the same way. They might have catalyzed an engagement, but they wouldn't have been the bulk of it. We would have leaned much more heavily on DVD, radio, um, and even broadcast. So again, I think the, the content is the same, but the distribution is different. And that was an issue for us. We Through Facebook, we found that we were surprised to find that a large percentage of our audience on these videos was coming from Sierra Leone, mm. Liberia. And that 
it was our first real metric that Nollywood stars have huge followings outside of Nigeria. But then when we wanted to extend the um, campaign, we couldn't in good faith say that that kind of content would have the same kind of distribution in a place like Liberia, where the landscape just isn't the same. We could have written a grant, but our conscience wouldn't let us, you know. You have a, a way of, you talk about using Twitter metrics, and Facebook metrics, and so on. Do you have a way of tracking this trickle-down effect of the messaging into illiterate communities and things like that, or is that not part of your, or no. How, how you? No, no, not for this. And I think one of the things we were remiss in not doing was a pretest for this content, because we didn't have time. Um, had we, we could have built out a much more robust evaluation of how that content played um, in illiterate communities. But I think what we had going for us on that is that it wasn't just English, it was Yoruba, Evo, Pigeon, and we had you know, television and, and radio where um, local languages could be heard and understood. But no, I think our one failure, and um, maybe Ebola alert is a little bit different on this, because I know they're um, advancing their institution to take on all other kinds of health goals. Hopefully, um, we'll all get a little bit better at evaluation. I think that's one of the general challenges and often failures of people who focus on <laughs> Um, the creation of public health communication and content are often not the people who are smart about evaluating it. And in this situation, the, the challenge of getting it out and getting it out as, the, as fast as possible led to some compromises on the research side. What are the steps you're working on, or is this project now finished? Um, well, so um, maybe just to not speak about my next steps, um, I'll give you sort of next steps for everybody involved. Ebola Alert is um, still working on Ebola and will stay working on Ebola till Ebola is eradicated, in which um, point they'll probably pivot and turn their uh, platform as a tool for other um, diseases. My organization, along with the three other partners we have, which is the co-creation of Nigeria, Niger Medic 247, which is a team of volunteer doctors, and Main Fame Productions, which is a Lego space production house, we are working on also pivoting our Lens On campaign to other health issues in Nigeria. My organization, Nollywood Workshops, is in the midst of several um, projects producing feature film content, narrative feature film content, as a vehicle for public health issues all throughout Nigeria. And personally, um, with a filmmaker, Sam Russell, out of New York City, we're in the beginning phases of doing a long-form feature film on Nigeria's Ebola containment. And some of the interviews you saw today are part of our research materials for framing this story. And I knew that some of the social media technology stuff would be left on the cutting room floor in terms of the 24 action thriller um, containment story, but I thought this was a great audience to share it with here. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thanks for coming.